As we've seen, plants occur in a variety of interesting habitats throughout the region, from sand plains to sand dunes to wetlands to forests to alpine summits. It's important to realize, though, that plants don't just occur in habitats. They create habitats and form the foundation for all of the other creatures that coexist with them. Here, we'll take a look at how plants and animals interact to gain a better understanding of how plants support all other life on Earth. Let's start small, with insects. Most of us know that many kinds of insects pollinate plants. Worldwide, about 200,000 species of insects are known to be active pollinators, and the majority of angiosperms, or flowering plants, rely on insects to move their pollen around. Meet the White Mountain Fritillary, a butterfly species known only from high alpine zones in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, which worldwide as a species only numbers in the hundreds. We've also been hearing in the news a lot about an alarming decline in important insect pollinators such as monarch butterflies and bumblebees. Many factors contribute to this phenomenon, including widespread use of pesticides, habitat destruction that removes plants that pollinators need, and diseases and parasites that are afflicting insects. Some pollinators are especially stressed when they're dependent on only one type of plant on which to lay eggs and feed and complete their life cycle. This federally endangered Carner blue butterfly needs native lupin, Lupinus perennis, which has become rarer due to the wholesale loss of the lupin's sand plain habitats. The good news is that efforts are underway to restore many sand plains. Pollinators are not just butterflies or bees either. Moths, beetles, flies, wasps, and even mosquitoes perform this critical task for plants. Now you might have noticed that I didn't actually mention ants in that group. People often wonder if ants, which are everywhere on plants, are also pollinators. Any of you who have peonies in your garden may have marveled at the ants that swarm all over the swelling flower buds. These winter or honeypot ants, Prenolepis imparis, which is very common in New England, are feverishly collecting nectar. But since the buds aren't open, and they're not actually helping the buds to open, they're not able to pollinate the flowers. And indeed, because ants live densely in colonies, they tend to exude strong antibacterial compounds as a way to keep the colony free of disease. These compounds, though, tend to kill pollen grains. So in short, for the most part, ants aren't great pollinators. However, ants do partner with plants in interesting ways. First off, ants are even better than earthworms at creating new soils on which plants thrive. Their constant excavation and turnover of soils in order to create their nests contributes a new inch of organic rich topsoil every 250 years. Some ants, like the Allegheny Mound Ant, build huge nests, seen in this seriously lumpy field, that hasten this process. Ants also disperse seeds. Several of our most beloved spring ephemeral plants, such as bloodroot, Sanguinaria canadensis, produce seeds with conspicuous fat and protein-rich appendages called oliosomes, which are like chocolate eclairs to ants. Ants clamp onto the oliosomes and drag the seeds back to their nests. They take the yummy stuff inside to feed the colony, leaving the naked seeds outside, which germinate on the rich soil that the ants have created. That way, a seed has actually moved far away from its parent plant, ensuring that it won't compete with mom and can establish in a new, very favorable site. Yes, insects do eat plants, sometimes much to our chagrin. Perhaps this tomato hornworm took out your prized heirloom tomato crop last year. But the relationships between ants and their enemies have resulted in some of the most valuable medicines that we use. Take, for example, aspirin. It comes from willows, trees in the genus Salix, seen in the middle here, which produce solicillin, a volatile hormone in response to insect attack that is the primary ingredient in aspirin. Other plants, such as oak, produce tannins, 
carbon-rich compounds that block up insects' digestive systems, which have historically helped us tan leather and dye wood. Mint and many other spices, such as mustard, hot pepper, and nutmeg, are exuded by plants as defenses against insect herbivores. Where would we be without them? Some plants attacked by herbivores send volatile signals to other plants to warn them, and those plants shortly upregulate production of their own defensive compounds. Other plants actually send signals to insects that can attack the insect herbivores that are eating the plants. Having gotten this signal, this parasitoid wasp on the right has flown to the signaling tomato plant and has laid her eggs on the tomato hornworm. Those eggs will hatch and soon begin to consume that poor caterpillar. I know, you're heartbroken. For also understanding why native plants and their evolved interactions with insects matter, I want to point you to a book by Professor Doug Tallamy, Bringing Nature Home. He's an entomologist who has definitively demonstrated how native, as opposed to non-native plants, support a diverse, functioning community of beneficial insects. But enough about bugs already. How about some of those bigger things we also care about? such as birds. Like ants, uh, birds also transport seeds because they feed hungrily on fruits. We can plant native species such as blueberries or American cranberry, uh, Viburnum opulus, which is pictured here, and many others that provide essential fodder to birds, especially in late summer as they're provisioning for their long migrations. Now, some of our birds have very specific habitat requirements centered on the plants they feed and nest on. The American pipit on the lower left is an endangered species that, like the white mountain fritillary, only thrives in alpine habitats. The scarlet tanager on the upper left needs deep interior forests in which to breed. This great blue heron in the middle needs clean rivers whose shoreline plants support fish and clean waterways. This savanna sparrow, on the upper right, nests in open sand plain plant communities. And the glossy ibis, on the lower right, feeds on fish and shellfish that can only thrive in salt marshes, sustained and literally held together by salt marsh grasses. And we'll return to that point in a little bit. Birds also use plants as nest material. How many of you have looked out your window in winter to see a bird's nest suddenly revealed when all the leaves are gone? Plants both shelter birds by hiding them in trees and shrubs and by giving them essential materials with which they can build their nests. Some birds also gather nectar and other rewards from plants, like this ruby-throated hummingbird. And in so doing, they act as pollinators too. And remember, birds eat insects. We would be up to our eyeballs and mosquitoes if birds were not around, finding insects inside of plants. And now on to mammals. The organisms to which we, as warm-blooded mammals ourselves, probably can best relate. Although any of you who have lost some of your plants to deer browse might be seething about this image, which shows an experimental deer exclosure at the Harvard Forest. It's a picture worth a thousand words. The plants growing on the inside of this fence are not browsed by deer. Everything outside this fence is and you can clearly see the difference. But deer do rely upon particular forest types to make their sleeping and, and feeding places. Deer have long been a part of this ecosystem, relying on plants for food and shelter. They're only truly bothersome when we, as humans, have eliminated their major predators, and uh, some heartfelt folks have taken to feeding them, much as one would feed birds. Our largest ungulates, moose, dwarf deer in size, but are no less reliant on plants for food and cover. They feed extensively on aquatic, wetland, and terrestrial plants. See that little maple leaf peeking out of his mouth? Other large denizens of our landscape are also vegetarians. Berries attract bears just as much as they do birds, especially in the run-up to winter. But bears also eat roots, grasses, and, of course, seeds. 
as any of you who have uh, <clears throat> forgotten to take in your bird feeders in spring, will attest. Now, all of our familiar mammals are omnivorous, with plants making up an important part of their diet. Also going after seeds, leaves, roots, and whatever other plant material that can get their paws on are raccoons, and chipmunks, squirrels, otters, woodchucks, foxes, fishers, rabbits, porcupines, and our best known plant engineer, the beaver, who uses plants as shelter to dam up ponds and to eat. Now beavers certainly know how to structure their habitats, but plants also structure their habitat using roots to hold fast the soil, changing soil chemistry, and modifying the ambient local temperature with their shade. Estuary marshes are plant-based bulwarks at the interface between land and sea. These are among the most productive ecosystems on the planet, and most of our commercially important fish and crabs and shellfish spend at least some portion of their lives in estuary marshes. The dense mats of rhizomatous grasses, such as smooth cord grass, Spartina alterniflora, or salt marsh hay, Spartana patens, and yes, it has been used for hay, salt grass, Distichylus spicata, and salt marsh rush, Juncus gerardii, literally hold the muddy soil together. Over years, decades, and centuries, these plants lay down layers of peat, which accrete and raise the marsh above sea level. Now, this assumes, of course, that these plants can keep pace with sea level rise and are not undermined by activities such as ditching or the incursions of invasive plants and even animal species. And lose these plants, a salt marsh becomes very quickly a hypersaline mudflat washed over and eroded by tides, as we see in the far distance in this photo from northeastern Massachusetts. Dominant plants, which bind substrate, influence nutrient and water cycling, regulate soil chemistry, create their own microenvironments, and provide habitat for countless other organisms, these are called foundation species. There are many examples out there such as the eastern hemlock, which forms deeply shaded, cool forests with acidic soils created from the litter of shed needles and a sparse understory. These forests contrast sharply with deciduous forest types. Can you think of other foundation species? Now to you, it may seem obvious that plants are part of a complex ecological web. Plants are at the base of a food chain that leads to our own dinner table. But many people take plants for granted, and so it's important for you to appreciate and be able to communicate to others the many aspects of their crucial roles.